Now the part of this chapter we're going to focus in on is starting in verse number 12. Where the Bible reads, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, what this is teaching us here is that, you know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and especially as someone who's not only a believer, but someone who's going to do work and try to live a godly life and live the way that God has outlined in the Bible, that you shouldn't think that it's strange, that it's a weird thing when you are tried with a fiery trial, when you have problems and events in your life that really test your faith, that really test you know, what you believe, and, and you go through hard times as a fiery trial which tries you. He says, don't think that that's a strange thing. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked as though some, wow, what in the world, where did this come from? He says, but rejoice. Be happy about that. When you see, and, and when you're going through a fiery trial, your first instinct is not going to be, hey, I'm happy about this. Or you're probably going to be freaking out, going, oh man, what am I going to do? Getting stressed out and having all kinds of problems. But he's saying, you know what? When the fiery trial comes, rejoice. And as much, and here's why, and as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So obviously, look, there's two different trials that people will face. You can face a trial because you're living a wicked, sinful life. And you shouldn't be surprised when you get judged for that either. When you're living a life of sin and you're having all these problems happen as a result, no shock, right? Of course you're going to go through problems when you're, when you're living a wicked life. But that's not what he's talking about here because he's talking about being partakers of Christ's sufferings. This is an event where you're doing good. And see, this is a problem where a lot of people run into that especially people who are just trying to get back on the right path, you know, maybe a lot of things have gone wrong and now it's like, I need to get things right now and you start doing right. And most people have this tendency to think that, well, I'm starting to do what's right so everything's going to work out for me now. But unfortunately what happens is that that's actually a time when you're going to be tested again or where the enemy is going to come and try to uh, knock you down and get you out from getting right with God. But people look at that and they look at their circumstances and they'll say, well, I'm doing everything right. And just throw up your hands and say, well, forget it all then because I tried to do what's right and it just didn't work out and I had problem after problem after problem. And that's the wrong attitude to have. We need to understand you know, when you look at, look at what happened to Christ. And this is, the, this is why he brings up Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ do everything right? Did Jesus Christ live for other people? Did he help other people? Did he do everything good and right that he was supposed to do? Absolutely he did. He wasn't going, well, why am I being arrested then? Why am I being persecuted? Why do people hate me? Why does everybody want me dead? He could have had that attitude. He could have thrown up his hand and said, well, forget it all then. Nuts to it. I mean, this is, you know, I, I'm trying to do what's right. Apparently, I'm not doing what's right because I'm having all these problems. No, actually, if you are doing what's right, you can expect to have at least similar problems that Jesus Christ had. I mean, if you're following in his steps, why would it be any different for you? Are you better than him? Of course not. So that's why I say, you know, don't count it some strange thing. Look, when you're doing right, you are going to be tested. You are going to have fiery trials that are going to try you. That's going to happen. It's going to come your way. And actually, instead of freaking out about it, instead of getting all upset about it, he says, rejoice. Be happy about it. Why? Because that puts you in company with Jesus Christ. And that's good company to be in. If you're being counted worthy to go through sufferings for Christ's sakes, hey, praise God for that. Now, I, the reason why I start out in this verse, this is not where we're, you know, this is just laying the groundwork for something I think is happening within our church. And I didn't preach a sermon this morning because there's a lot of people here that were just visiting. We had a lot of guests, but um, not that it necessarily matters, but I, wanted, I want people to know, I, I, I fully 100% believe our church is under attack. Our church is spiritually under attack. And even though our church is very small, we're, we're running about 20 people. 
Okay, it was a small church. But we're actually doing something. We're actually hitting the ground and getting people saved and preaching the gospel, which, which no one else is doing. I mean, the only people doing this work preach a false gospel. And I know we are having a good impact. And it's not fully realized yet. We need to have eyes like Elisha had where he opened up Gehazi's eyes, he opened up his servant's eyes and was able to see all the angels around him. It's hard to see the impact we're having right now because we're still a real young church, because we're still kind of small, but we are having an influence. Guarantee you that. Guaranteed. We are reaching a lot of people. We've knocked almost every door in Prescott Valley. Literally. We're having an influence. I know sometimes it could feel like a strain because we still haven't like really grown that much. We still feel kind of small. People have come, people have gone. But don't let that discourage you. I'm looking around though and I know within our church, even though it's a small church, that Satan does not want this church to succeed. We're living in an area where independent fundamental Baptist churches have already, since in the, in the less than four years since we've been a church, the two of them are gone. I believe there's only one left in this town at all other than us these other and, and I've, I've heard a lot about churches that you know independent fundamental baptist churches have started up and died started up and died that shows me that spiritually there's an attack against the right move against the word of god against the truth now this isn't something i'm just making up in my head because i have a lot of knowledge of the members of our church and i think that practically every single member of our church has had some very serious problems in their home lives this year. And I've witnessed it. Some I have a lot of details on, some I don't have very many details on, but I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with everybody and even within my own home included. Now, a lot of these problems, you know, I'm not gonna go into any details, I'm not gonna try to bring out pe you know, people's issues and problems that they're having, but even things, you know, marriage problems, other problems that you might be having at home, look, I believe that Satan is trying to get this church to fail. I believe there's a lot of people who are trying to do what's right and trying to live godly. And, and he's attacking the individual. See, look, the way that Satan's going to attack this church, he's not going to use someone yet, I believe, to infiltrate and split the church. We're too small for that. Usually bigger churches, he'll send in people who, like our Judas Iscariots, that are just going to go in to try to divide and split up the church and destroy it that way. And, but the way he's going to do it with this church, and it's a, you know, it's a similar method used in other churches as well. He's going to be attacking individuals and tempting you with sin and trying to, get you, you know, trying to get you out of the fight, trying to get you veered off of the course and trying to get you off into worrying about every other thing except for what God wants you to do. This is going on. And, and you know, especially people visiting tonight, you know, you need to hear this message, but specifically if you're a member of this church, listen up because this is serious and, and I know that this is happening. And you might be wondering why, you know, why are these things happening now? I was wondering why are things happening even in my own personal life? This, is, this has to be the reason. We are under attack. Why? Because we are doing a good work. So first of all, don't forget that and don't consider it a strange thing that when you're doing good and when you're doing right, that these fiery trials are going to try you. Now, the trials that you face, they're not fun, especially when they deal with close relatives, family members, spouses, whatever, whatever the case, right? We, we've had a lot of very personal attacks in all of our lives individually. It's not fun. But rec one, recognize where the problems are coming from. Hopefully, these are coming more as a result of you serving God and not from your own sins. Don't be negligent of that fact. Always, 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 this is, this is a good way to, to treat the problems in your life or to look at these things. Do a self-analysis. When you have all kinds of bad things happening, the first person you should be looking at is yourself. Don't look at anyone else or any, you know, don't just blame everything on Satan. Now, do I believe Satan's attacking this church? Yes, I do. But don't just go ahead and kind of just blow all the blame off. And, oh, well, it's all just Satan. We need to be aware that, hey, these attacks are coming. We need to be stronger. We need to make sure that we are keeping ourselves as pure as possible. We need to make sure now more than ever, hey, I'm, I'm tightening up the belt on my life to make sure that, that I'm not kind of getting off into sinful areas that I, that I need to, to veer away from. 
put the focus on yourself first and say, where am I failing? What can I fix? And then go outward from there and try to help people in your family or whatever else and do the job that you need to do in your particular situation. We need to stick together as a church also and be faithful. One of the big things that people have a tendency to do when you're going through problems, whether it's their own sin problem or whether it's just some other problem, they're facing persecution or being attacked, one of the things that people have, like the first thing they do is get out of church. Well, I have to deal with this thing so I don't have time to go to church. I, don't, you know, I have so much stuff I have to deal with this. And that is the wrong choice every single time. Every time. Look, if you believe, if you believe, this, if you believe this is the word of God and you're having problems in your life, no matter what the problems are, the answers are going to be found in this book every time. It's here. And you're going to receive the encouragement and the edifying and the help that you need through other people who believe the same thing. Amen. You need that in your life. You need that support. We all need that. You know, God instituted the local church for many reasons. It's not just one reason. It's not just to receive preaching from a pastor, although that is one reason. For someone to be able to teach and to help and to expound on God's word. That's one of the reasons, but that's not the only reason. We need to be exhorting one another. And so much the more, as we see the day approaching, the Bible says, we're here as a church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, to be there for each other, to remain faithful and loyal to each other, and to help out during your times of need, and to be looking out for those that are weak when they need help as well. That is what, you know, a big aspect of what the church is here for. We need to be faithful, stick together, faithful to God, faithful to our families, and faithful to church. And the, the topic I'm preaching on tonight is faithfulness and loyalty. When someone is faithful, they're dependable, they're reliable, or something who's always there. And we need to always be there for God. We need to always be there for our family. We need to always be there for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need that faithfulness. Turn, if you would, to uh, Proverbs chapter 18. You see, there's coming a time, and the days are only getting worse. We see the progression. We see the wickedness. We see the signs of the times around us. Amen. We see how the world is getting more and more wicked, and there's more and more of a wicked influence on our lives from the world. And we can see how you know, the, the end is going to be shaping up. We see the new world order coming into, into play. We see, you know, the Antichrist is going to be coming soon. He's setting up everything's in place for a one world government, which is what the book of Revelation talks about. It's going to happen. And we see these things happening. And as things get more and more out of control, more and more wicked, we need each other that much more. We need our families to be strong at home. We need our church to be strong here and locally together. We need to have this level of faith. And we need to make sure that we are being faithful to God more than ever. There's a time coming. I'll just read this for you from Matthew 10, verse 21. The Bible says, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. There's a time coming when even your own family is going to turn against you for your faith in Jesus Christ. It's prophesied. It's going to happen. Now, I believe this is probably going to happen in my lifetime. Do I know that for a fact? No, of course not. But it seems to be that way. Everything seems to be going in that direction. If it's not my lifetime, it's going to be very shortly thereafter. But this is going to happen. I mean, these are the words of Jesus Christ that I just read to you. Look, the Father's going to you know, put the Son to death. The Son's going to deliver up the Father. They're all going to be turning them in to the Antichrist government. Hey, we've got another believer over here. Hey, here's another one that doesn't want to take the mark of the beast. It's going to happen, which makes it that much more important. I mean, this is talking about physical families, which is why us as believers really need to make sure that we're sticking together and being faithful and being loyal to each other and being there to help one another out. You're in Proverbs 18. Look at verse number 24. Proverbs 18, verse number 24, the Bible reads, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We want to make sure we're making the right friends and making friends with other like-minded believers because 
you make a good friend, you could make a friend that will stick closer to you than even your, you know, your blood-related brother. Someone that will be there for you no matter what. And it's important to have these friends. You don't want to be all by yourself. You don't want to be alone in this world. You want to be able to, to be able to rely on other people and to have other people be able to rely on you to help them out. We need friends and we need to find a close friend that's willing to stick with you closer than a brother. And I'll tell you what, this is one place you'll be able to find friends like that. Because I know all the people that come to this church and I know their hearts and I know that people love God and people who love God are going to be your best types of friends anyways. People who are, who are living a life that is going to be accordance to the way the scripture says, people who esteem others better than themselves are going to be concerned more about you than about them. And that's the way we ought to be walking. That's the way the Bible teaches us to be walking and those are going to be the best friends. Because they're, they're worried about you. They're concerned about you. They care about you. And people here are going to care about you enough to tell you even when you're doing something wrong. Now, look, we're not out here just judging every little thing that everybody does. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, there are some churches like that get a bad reputation because every little thing they're looking down their nose at everyone else. But I'll tell you what, there are times when, when we all kind of need to get some type of a rebuke. We need to be corrected on things. And a friend, a true friend that cares about you will humbly be able to point out that correction that's needed in your life and say, hey, you know, I kind of see you going down this path you know, a good friend that cares about you is going to tell you that. Just like, you know, people, people call us hateful and mean because we go out and we talk about hell and we talk about the punishment for our sins and everything else. Oh, you're a sinner. You deserve hell. Yeah. Well, it's not very loving. You know what's loving is telling them about it because if people don't even realize that, if you don't even understand that, hey, my sin is actually, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm not even that bad. God's not going to send me to hell. That's what most people think. That's why we go over that all the time. And we point out, look, it's not just for, hell is not just for murderers. The Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. We all deserve this punishment, so why would I want to lie to somebody just to give them a false sense of security, a false sense that they're feeling good? That's not very loving. I mean, I could tell people till I'm blue in the face, oh, don't worry about it. As long as you haven't done anything that bad, you'll be just fine. You'll go to heaven. And that's a big fat lie. That might make someone feel comfortable for a short period of time. But in the end, what's that going to do? It's going to send them to hell. That's not very loving. The loving person's going to say, hey, watch out. You're destined for hell. Receive the free gift of Jesus Christ and you'll be saved forever. And it's the same way when we preach on sin, when we talk about you know, the commandments that God has put forth. Look, you just need to have this knowledge. You need this information so you can make the right choices. I'm not going to sugarcoat sin and tell you everything's aren't that bad. Look, if the Bible says it's wicked, it's wicked. And you need to know that. So you don't go and start doing wicked things. And God comes down and starts punishing you for that. But we need to make good friends. Turn if you would to Genesis chapter 14. I want to show you a good example of someone who is extremely faithful. Because what I want to instill in you tonight, what I want to, to drive home is this concept of just being a faithful person, being a faithful church member, being a faithful spouse, being a, 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 a faithful uh, friend, you know, having a, a good sense of being a loyal person, a faithful person in, in the various aspects of your life. And someone who is faithful more than just about anyone else that I could think of is Abraham. Abraham is such an awesome example of a man who was faithful in all that he did. He was faithful in his service to God. He was faithful in, in just going places. When God told him to go, he just went. He didn't even know where he was going, and he just went. He was reliable. It depends. God could say, Abraham, do this, and he says, okay, I'll go do it. He was also faithful to his family. He was faithful to Lot. And we're going to look at this example here of how he was faithful to Lot. Genesis 14, verse number 12. Now look, mind you, Lot was not some righteous guy. 
And the Bible says he was saved, but he was not like living this great life. He wasn't living like Abraham was living. Let's put it that way. He was more concerned about the things of the world. He cared about the rich land. That's what he wanted to go to this area. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He, he, he was interested in what they were doing. Before you know it, he's end up living in Sodom. So Lot is not this example of some great person that you're really going to be bending over backwards to want to help. See, when people are, are great people and they're real nice and they're friendly to you and they help you out, you're not more inclined to want to help them out. I mean, it's, that's our nature, right? But a faithful person is going to help out and be loyal even when that person isn't necessarily doing good by you or to you. You know what I mean? Someone who's got leaving a lot to be desired as far as being a good friend or being a good family member. Maybe, they, you know, maybe Lot wouldn't have done the same thing for Abraham. But Abraham doesn't look at that and say, oh, well, if you're not going to do it for me, then I'm not going to do it for you. No, Abraham was faithful. He says, I don't care if you're going to do this for me because I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to be there for you. Genesis 14, look at verse number 12. We'll see this story. There was this, this great war, five kings against four kings, and, and Lot kind of got caught up in the mix on, on the losing side here. Verse number 12, the Bible says, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now, I've gone over this when we, when we did our Bible study through the book of Genesis, but um, these were five kings against four kings' armies at this time. Abraham, when he finds out Lot was taken captive, he chases after them with 318 people. Okay, a king of uh, 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 armed forces for four kings worth, you know, or five kings worth, I think they had a little bit more than 318 people, wouldn't you say? But Abraham was faithful and dependable. He says, you know what? If I could do anything about this, I'm going to go and, and do something. I'm going to put my neck on the line to save my family, to be faithful to Lot. 318 souls pursued unto Dan, verse 15, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So Abraham goes and saves the day. He's faithful to, to Lot, even though Lot doesn't necessarily deserve it. That's the faithfulness of Abraham. He puts his neck on the line and, and is willing to help out. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter number six. Daniel chapter six. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11, 13. We're talking about being faithful, being a faithful friend. A faithful friend isn't going to gossip. Proverbs 11, 13 says, A tale bearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Faithfulness has a lot to do with trust. When you're being dependable, people can trust you. They can rely on you. When you get, have friendships, you know, oftentimes you're privy to information that they don't want to necessarily have public. And if you're going to be a faithful friend, you're not going to be revealing their secrets to everyone else. You're going to be someone who's trustworthy, someone who, hey, I can go to you and I can speak to you in confidence and I can trust that you're going to be faithful and not just go and share all my secrets to the world and be some tale bearer and start gossiping and tell, hey, did you know that so-and-so has this? Real? That is completely unfaithful and that's wicked and it's wrong. We need to make sure that we are being faithful and that when someone confides in you that you can treat that seriously you can be a faithful person and conceal the matter and not just go and spread it abroad remaining faithful we're going to see here in daniel chapter six is going to sustain you when the enemy attacks i told you our church is under attack why is it so important to be faithful because that is what's going to help you to stay right that's going to help this church to continue to get through this and help you individually in your life through the problems that you're having by remaining 
faithful, staying the course, staying on track, not getting swerved off to the left hand or to the right, but continuing forward is going to keep you from, from sustaining damage as a result of the attacks, as a result of the fiery trial that's trying you. Daniel chapter 6, verse number 4. Daniel was an extremely faithful man. Daniel, who was someone who he was just doing right by God and living his life and ended up being exalted and lifted up in the kingdom to where he was basically the first in charge next to the king. He was like the right-hand man. And as a result, the other people, the other leaders who were just underneath Daniel, they envied him. They wanted that spot. And they envied him so much that they're trying to find a way where they could get some dirt on Daniel. They're saying, look, we, need, you know, we want this guy out of here. This guy irritates me. He's, you know, he's this Christian guy. You know, and, and I don't know why the king likes him so much. Put him in his position. You know, we ought to be in that position. So they're trying to find whatever they can. And look, when you're living a Christian life, if you're living a life that's going to be pleasing in God's eyes, other people ought to know about it. And I'm not saying because you're lifting yourself up, but because when you're living the way that God says to live, you're going to be different than people. It's going to be apparent. It should be apparent. And it's not that you're trying to rub it in anyone's face. It's just when you're trying to do what's right, guess what? A lot of the things that the world likes to do, you won't be doing anymore. Right. Hey, let's go out to the bar. Let's go out to the street. Sorry, can't do that. Hey, let's go see this movie. Sorry, I don't watch that filth. Hey, let's, you know, it's going to be evident. Why? Because I'm living by standards. Because I'm trying to live the way that God said to live. I don't want to be getting into all kinds of sin. Hey, let's go to this. No, I can't on Sunday. I got church. You go to church? Yeah, it's important to me. These things happen all the time. Daniel was a faithful man. And see, when you do that, a lot of people are going to be hating you. And when, and when you do that, people are thinking, oh, you know, even though you may not have this mentality, people are thinking, oh, so-and-so thinks that they're just better than everyone else. Oh, what, you're too good to go to the bar with me? Oh, you're too, you know. It's like, look, I didn't say that. You're just trying to do what's right, but they're looking at you in that way. So what's going to happen is they start despising you, and they're going to be looking at you with a fine mic, you know, oh, not so good, you know, trying to look for any reason to bring you down. Any time that you slip, oh, oh, yeah, I thought you were such a holy Christian. Oh, I thought, you know, they're going to be looking at you for that. You need to be aware of that. Now, look, we, I know we're not perfect, and I mentioned this this morning. If you want to look close enough in my life, you're going to find some sin. Okay? I'm not going to be proud of it, whatever, you know, whatever you find, it's going to be there because I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But just because I'm not perfect doesn't mean I'm just going to throw up my hands and go off the deep end and just say, oh, forget it, because it's just too hard. No. Look, you can live a reasonably righteous life. You can live a way where, yeah, you're still not perfect, but you're living in a way where people can't find an occasion or a fault against you. That's the way Daniel was living. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse number 4. The Bible says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They're trying to find an area where he's screwing up, where he's not doing his job right, where he's failing. It says, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. So they're trying to find, you know, oh, is Daniel taking bribes? Is he cheating the clock? Is he, you know, where can we get Daniel? And they couldn't find anything. Why? Because he was living a righteous life. Was Daniel perfect? No, but I mean, he was living a righteous life enough to where they can't just go and say, hey, look, Daniel's, you know, cheating hours over here, getting overpaid. Daniel's taking these bribes and letting these things, you know, none of that stuff at all. He was being faithful. So even when his enemies were now trying to attack him, they were restricted. There's a lot of things they couldn't do because of his faithfulness. So when you can remain faithful, when the enemy comes to attack, there ought to be not very much for him to succeed in bringing you down. Because no matter, and, and see, in this spiritual battle, 
The good thing is this. You know, in a physical battle, someone might just be able to physically overpower you and kill you, right? In a spiritual battle, it is a lot, you have a lot more influence on how well you're going to do. Because in this spiritual battle, part of it is just staying, staying alive, right? You want to you stay with it. And you have control over that. You can determine to stay faithful or not. You can choose to do right and to do wrong. I mean, everything we do in this life is a matter of our choice. You make up your mind. Am I going to do this? Am I not going to do this? Am I going to get into sin? Am I going to do what's right? And when you remain faithful and continue to make the right just choices, there's going to be that much less for the attacker to be able to bring you down. Because what are they going to say about you? Well, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Turn if, you would to, uh, turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 13. Now we're going to start getting into a little bit of the faithfulness of the Lord. We ought to be faithful. And the, the best example that we have for us to being faithful is how faithful God is. And that is the faithfulness of the Lord is incredible. Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse number four. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is the faithfulness that we have of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is what we were just out preaching about and talking to people about, is that God has a gift of eternal life for us sinners. And once you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, he will never leave you nor forsake you. And we were ta I was talking to someone earlier today that said, well, um, you know, if you were to turn your... I said, is there anything you can do where God is going to take away your salvation from you, where, where God still might send you to hell. And this lady said, well, maybe if you turn your back on God, right? You turn your back on God. So what does that mean? You stop living right. You stop following those abandons. You stop listening to them, right? That's turning your back on God. Well, even if you turn your back on God, what does that do if Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you? So the example goes like this. Brother Sebastian, come up here for a minute, please. Stand over here. You're going to represent a saved person, okay? You're saved. And I'm going to represent Jesus, okay? Just for some, a far cry from Jesus Christ, but just for this example, I'm going to represent Jesus Christ, okay? So, you're saved because you put your faith on Jesus, but now what happens if Brother Sebastian turns his back on me and he wants to start walking that way? But I've already promised, Jesus already promised, hey, look, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. He turns his back on me, go ahead and start walking away. Well, if I'm going to keep my word, guess what? He's got his back to me, but you know what? I'm never leaving him or forsaking him. I'm here the whole time. Thanks, man. Go, go take a seat. Do you see how that works? He didn't lose his salvation. Jesus was right there the whole time. I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. That's faithfulness. Now, in the context in which this was brought up, it has to do with marriage. Turn if you would to Ephesians 5. I'll just read it for you. We're, we're, we're in Hebrews 13. I read this already. Marriage is honorable in all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So the Bible is saying, you know, if you're going to have a, 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 an intimate relationship with someone of the opposite gender... You need to be married. It's honorable. The bed's undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, people go out and commit fornication and sleep around when they're not married or when they are married, go out and commit adultery. It says God's going to judge that. And he says, let your conversation be without covetousness. When people have covetousness, they're looking on things that they can't have. When you're not married and you're looking on another woman that you want to sleep with, you want to lay with, you're being covetous. You can't have that until you get married. 
When you're married to someone and you're looking at another person that you want to sleep with, hey, you can't have that because you're married because otherwise it'd be adultery. That's covetousness. And that's why he says, be content with such things as you have. Hey, whoever you're married to, be content with that person. Be happy with that person. That's enough for you. Don't have wicked eyes looking at other people. Why? Why should we be like this? Because Jesus said, hey, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. And this is an attitude that we need to have in our marriage because marriage is literally a picture of Christ in the church. And we see that in Ephesians chapter five. Turn to Ephesians five. I think I already told you to do that. Stay in Ephesians five here. We'll look at this. Now, I've done a lot of preaching out of Ephesians 5 in the past year or so because the culture we live in is so against what this teaches. And I just feel like it needs to be hammered home more frequently than in previous years because, it, I mean, this is like, <laughs> if husbands and wives can get this down, it would save so so many marriages. This is so important. Um, and, and it goes beyond just the way that we act in our home. Th this picture of marriage is literally a picture of salvation in Jesus Christ in the church. And Ephesians 5 explains that. Let's read the passage. Verse 22. The Bible reads, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now keep all these verses in mind because it's going to be applying the husband and wife relationship to Jesus Christ and the church. Okay? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. So each local church ought to be operating with Jesus Christ as the head of this church. We are doing everything to please our boss, Jesus Christ. Everything that's done within this church is for Jesus Christ. It's for his glory. It's for his honor. That he's our head. He's the one that determines what we do. He's the one that determines what we believe. Jesus Christ. He's the head. And the Bible is saying in that same way, the husband is the head of the household. The husband is the head, meaning he's in charge. Just as much as Jesus is in charge of this church, the husband is, the head, is in charge at home. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands and everything. How much are you subject to Jesus Christ? To everything. That's the same way that the wives are to be subject unto their husbands. Now look, I know that this doesn't happen in many homes today. And I know it's not popular, but it's what the Bible says. And it needs to be hammered home. We need to just accept. Look, do you love God's word or not? Do you love it all? Or do you just want to cherry pick the things that you like and throw out the things you don't like? Just as a side note, you know, God's laws and his rules are not bad for us. God is not some grumpy old man that just wants us to not enjoy life and not have any fun. And oh, you Baptists, you have all these rules and you can't do this and you can't do that. Thinking that it's some like bad thing or some hindrance to our life. The rules that God has laid out are actually a benefit for us. It's a benefit for us. What happens when you say, oh, uh, you know, thou shalt not kill. Okay, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> that's not, God's not withholding any fun. Oh, I can't go and stab somebody. Okay. No stealing, right? Don't be a thief. Okay, pretty self-evident. Okay, what about fornication? Oh yeah, you can't go around and sleep around. What happens when you do? One, it devalues the act of that and your intimacy level. When you ever do find someone that you do want to spend the rest of your life with, well, now you've already gone and whored around with all these other people and it's not that meaningful anymore because when you finally found someone you actually love, you've already done this act with so many other people and you might have picked up some diseases along the way. And look, it's not healthy to do that, to exchange body fluids with other people on a regular basis like that. It's supposed to be one person that you devote for your life to do that with. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make your marriage that much better when you withhold that virgin to, until you get married. It's for your benefit. 
It's going to make your life better. It's going to make your marriage better. It's going to make everything better. It's, it's God knows the way that he designed us. He made us the way, uh, you know, everything he made about us, he knows way more than we know. He knows what's good for us. He knows what's not good for us. When the Bible says not to, to even look upon alcohol, not to go, God doesn't want me to go out and have fun. No, God doesn't want you to utter foolish things and say stupid things and do things that you wouldn't normally do and put poison in your body and kill your organs and die of some cirrhosis of the liver later on in life and have some painful death. Look, God doesn't want that for you. Yeah, I know he's such a mean God that doesn't want you to have any fun. But see, people have this, this perverted notion of equating sin with fun because you've been deceived by Satan. Because Satan makes this big production out of sin and puts it on a billboard and wants to make it look so cool and, oh man, you gotta have this. In the end of it, it's not that good. It's actually worse than not that good. It's gonna bring death. But let's keep reading here in a few. That's kind of a side note. We're talking about the picture that marriage represents of Jesus Christ in the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The husband is the head of the wife. Let's keep reading here. Verse 26. Or excuse me, verse 25. I don't think we read this. Verse 25. Because this is the husband's role now. We, we read the, the wife's submissive role. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So you think about the picture of Jesus Christ loving people so much that he gave his own flesh and body to hang up on a cross, to suffer shame, to bleed, and to die out for us, and to go to hell. That's love. That is a lot of care and love for people that didn't deserve it, for you and me. That is the type of love that he's saying, husbands, love your wives. That is, a serious, that is not just this passing love. That's not just, oh, I love you, honey. I mean, look, you know, we know how day-to-day -day life goes, but you ought to have, if you have a love that Christ had for the, for the church, we need to have that love for our wives, those of us that are married. You need, you need to maintain that level of love. Think about it. You didn't deserve Christ's love. Maybe sometimes your wife might do things, oh, she doesn't deserve, but you know, love her anyways. That's your role. You don't determine when you're going to pick and choose to be in God's will or not. I mean, that's what we end up doing, but you just need to be doing it all the time. You love your wife because you're married to that person. Wives, obey your husband because you're married to that person. Because not only is it the bond of marriage and the vows that you made one to another, you are, represent, you, you're, you are acting out a, a pictorial representation of Jesus Christ in the church. So when people split up and, and get divorced, and have all these problems, you know what you're doing to that picture of Jesus Christ in the church? You're completely distorting and warping that view. It goes beyond just you. And this is something that people see, well, where's the faithfulness? Where is the faithfulness when people get split up, when people get divorced? Where is the faithfulness? Who's not being faithful? Look, I'll say this to the day I die, from the day I got married, my wife's heard this before, I'm never gonna leave my wife. I'm never going to forsake her. I don't care what happens. What if she, I don't care. Look, I'm not going to leave my wife or forsake her. It's not going to happen. And if she ever wants to leave me, it's going to be really difficult. <laughs> because I am never going to allow that to happen as much as is in my power. I will fight it every way. I don't know what the laws are. I don't know what the divorce laws are or everything like that. I don't care. I don't know what they are. But however much I am going to impede that process until I die, okay? Be why? Because I am going to try to remain faithful because I want to be there and I want to fulfill my vow and I want to be there for her because I, I'm, I want to do what's right. I want to do what's right according to Scripture. I want to have a good representation of Jesus Christ in the church. I don't want people to think, oh, well, you said it was until death do us part, but now you're not doing that. You said it was eternal life. Oh, but now all of a sudden it's not. That's what happens when people get divorced. That's the picture you're, you're, you're displaying for the world to see. 
how much do you value your, your salvation? How much do you want other people to get saved? How much do you want to bring forth that, that notion and, and that concept? Hey, apply that to your marriage. Let's finish off this chapter. We'll, um, so husbands, okay, verse 25, we read that. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This was in reference to how the husbands love the wives, the same way that Christ loves the church. And Christ loves the church in order to sanctify it, in order to cleanse it, in order to help the church to do right, to do even better. Hey, husbands ought to be loving their wives and also trying to help them to become better, to, to be without spot, to be without blemish, to, to, to help them along the way spiritually because you are the spiritual leader just as Jesus Christ is a spiritual leader of the church and providing the guidance and the wisdom and the knowledge in the way that you rule your home. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ, in the church. He's making it evident the, 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 the symbolism that goes back and forth between a marriage and the way that Christ is with the church. Let's keep our marriages holy and be faithful in our homes and not allow this wicked thought of, of departing and leaving to ever even enter one time. Look, your spouse should be your closest friend. The one person that you should be able to rely upon at any time, no matter what. We already read the verse about, you know, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But you know who that friend ought to be that's closer than everybody else is your spouse. And if that's not the case, you need to work on that. You need to make it known that you will be there for them no matter what and that they can always come to you and rely on you to be there no matter what's going on and that you will be there. And if they don't understand that, make that clear. Make it clear not through just your words, but your actions. You need to be able to overcome any conflicts or issues in your marriage and pledge to remain faithful and to make sure that it's known. I mean, there's no... You can ask my wife, not just because I said it tonight, but I've been saying this for a long time. She knows that <laughs> I am never going to leave her. She could, be, she could be comfortable in that. No matter what she does and no matter what I do, she could at least be comfortable every single night that she goes to sleep, that she should have zero doubt in her mind. I wonder if my husband's going to leave me. I mean, do you ever have a doubt? I wonder if Jesus Christ is going to send me into hell. Not for a second, right? Isn't that a good feeling to at least just be confident in your salvation to know even when you screw up, even when you backslide, even when you get into some sin and you go, man, I can't believe that I did that. And you feel horrible for doing what you did. At least you have the comfort of knowing that your soul is still saved because of what Jesus did for you. We need to transmit and have that same feeling to our spouse that no matter what they do, they can at least be confident in knowing that, well, we may have rough patches. I may make some really bad mistakes. She may make some really bad mistakes. We may hurt each other. We may do things that are bad. But at least I know that they're never going to leave me. And to, to allow them to have that level of, of confidence and faithfulness, knowing that, hey, I'm still going to be there for you. If you're married, you should never, ever threaten to leave your spouse or actually leave them. That should not be a thought that even crosses your mind one time. It's wickedness. And I look, I know people say things sometimes when they're angry, emotions get out of control and you end up saying some things you shouldn't say or doing some things you shouldn't do. But look, this is a serious issue. This is something that if, if you can get this one thing down, this will give you the marriages that are going to last for 50 and 60 years. It's going to keep you together. 
faithfulness. I'm going to stay there and be there, and I'm not going to allow this notion of failure to enter into my mind one time. It's not an option. There is no going back. We are married, and it's until death do us part. And it's never going to solve your problems anyways. All it's going to do is hurt the other person. When you, when you threaten to leave, all that does is hurt. Hurt deep. That is not going to help your marriage in any way, shape, or form. If you actually do leave, God's not going to bless you for that either. In the vast majority of times when it comes into marital problems, people just need to get over themselves and decide to just be humble and to be faithful. 99% of the time, that's, that's the issue. We need to just look at ourselves and say, and, look, and not just look at ourselves, look at this book and be honest with it to realize where we're failing, where our shortcomings are, and just say, yeah, this does apply to me. I'm not going to make excuses for myself anymore. I'm just going to believe what this says and apply it to my life. God's faithfulness. Let's continue on here. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're almost done tonight. We're almost done. Actually, you know what? I'll just read this for you. Turn, if you turn, forget 2 Timothy 2. I'll read it for you. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 89. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 89. 2 Timothy 2, I love using this when we go out soul winning, just try and explain people because every once in a while you get someone that'll say, you know, you're talking to them about eternal life and you say, well, is there anything that person can do where they can lose their salvation? And a, a logical step that people take is say, well, if salvation comes because I put my faith in Jesus, I believe in him, well, then won't I no longer have it if I stop believing in Jesus? And, you, you know, when people say that, that makes, I can see where you're going with that, right? You, you can see the logic behind that. The problem with that is that once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he already gives you eternal life. That's given to you. So from that moment forward, you have it and it, and it lasts forever. But the Bible even handles that instance exalting the faithfulness of God and the promises that he makes. In 2 Timothy 2.13, if you want to just write it down, this is where I'm going to read for you. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we believe not, we, right? The author of this book, writing, writing to Timothy, if we believe not, people who have already believers in Jesus Christ, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Even if we go as far as to say, it, it, God forbid, one day in my life, I go, you know what? I don't believe in Jesus anymore. And just make this proclamation, say, I'm done with it. I did already believe on Jesus Christ with all of my heart. It was genuine, it was real, it wasn't just some fake thing. So because of that, because I put my faith in Christ, God has already given me the gift of eternal life. And he cannot go back on that promise. He cannot go back on something he already said, something he already did, and take it back. Why? Because God is faithful. Praise God for his faithfulness. Amen. Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is a great psalm that, that mentions multiple times the faithfulness of our God, the, the reliability of our God. When God says something, you guarantee it's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. It's true. There is no, God is truth and there is no, you know, he's light. There's no darkness in him. He speaks the truth. There is no lies that come from God. We can rely and trust 100% on the Lord our God. 100%. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Anybody can lie to you, but you know what? God's true. God is faithful. God remains faithful to his word and faithful to the promises that he makes to us. It's the only reason why I could stand here today and say, I know 100% for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. That's it. Why? Because I'm faithful? No, because God's faithful. That's why. It's not my own faithfulness. Psalm 89, verse number one. 
I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the, God, unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? Or to thy faithfulness, round about thee. Let's jump down now to verse number 24. Because this psalm goes on and on. We're not going to read the whole thing just for sake of time. Read, read the whole thing later. Great psalm. Verse number 24. Or let's start reading verse number 22. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. This is talking about David. Uh, go, if you go back up to verse number 20, I found David my servant with my holy oil and I've anointed him. And he's talking about how he's going to defend him. He's going to beat down his foes and his enemies. And, but my faithfulness and my mercy are going to be with him. God remains faithful. Why? God made a promise unto David and to his seed that of the seed of David, you know, Christ was going to come one day. He made, a, he made a similar promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. They received these promises of God. And when God makes a promise, he is faithful and sure to keep them. Jump down to verse number 33. The Bible says, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. God never suffers his faithfulness. Look, it's it's going to happen no matter what. And then verse 37, It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. We ought to be reflecting God's faithfulness to us. As much as God is faithful to his promises, to his word, to his love for us, to his mercy, his loving kindness, we need to have the same faithfulness. If we want this church to survive, we need to remain uh, faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, last place I ever turn. We'll close on this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and we're done. We need to be strong. In order to be strong, you need to remain faithful. You want to have a strong friendship. Be faithful to that friend. Be there for that friend, especially in their time of need. You want to have a strong marriage? Be faithful to your spouse, especially when things go bad. Look, be faithful. Be there for them at all times. If you want to be uh, successful in church and in your walk with God, be faithful to church. Be faithful to God's word. Be faithful to the things of God. Be reliable. Be someone that God can look at and say, hey, here's someone that not only reads my words, but actually applies them in their life and tries to do them. Be faithful to God. That will keep you strong. That will keep you going through. Just one last bit of comfort as we go through our trials and these fiery trials and temptations that we ought to be rejoicing through, and they're not always pleasant. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse number 12. You say, well, maybe, like, I'm not having any problems right now in my life. Everything's going pretty good. Well, praise God. I hope that's the case for everybody in here. I don't think it's true, but I hope that's the case for everybody. I hope everything's going really well. I hope you're not having all these fiery trials going on right now. I know many of us have, though, and are still going through things. Verse number 12 here, 1 Corinthians 10 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Things may be going great for you right now. Hey, take heed. Pay attention. This is still important. You still need to remain faithful. Even when things aren't going bad, especially when things aren't going bad, maintain the faithfulness so that maybe when the trials come, things won't really go that bad. Because you're faithful. Because you're taking heed. So that you don't fall. Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. How faithful is God? 
there is no end to his faithfulness. It never fails. So when God says any temptation or trial that you experience, look, it's common to men. You are not the only one dealing with this. You're not the only one to have ever gone through the problems that you're going through. You might feel like you're isolated. You might feel like, oh man, this is only me. No one else understands. No, it's common to man. The temptations that you are faced with, there's many people that have faced the same thing. It's common to man, but take comfort in the fact that God who is faithful, God whose faithfulness never fails, will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted above that you are able. Whatever it is that you're going through, God won't allow it to ever be too much. There is always a way out, is what it says here. It says, will with the temptation always also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Nothing is unbearable. It may bring you right to that point, but God won't let you go beyond that point. I'm not saying it's easy. It's easy to read the words or maybe to hear the words. It's harder to put it into practice. I get it. But it's so important that we could trust and take the cover. No, look, you know what? In, in the worst of my times, God is going to still be faithful. You know, this is a really difficult time, but I'm not going to give up and quit. If you can just have faith that God will be faithful to you, then you can keep enduring and not quit. You need to have it in your head, though, that quitting is the, I mean, quitting is the opposite of being faithful. When you quit on your marriage, you're not being faithful. When you quit and get out of church, you're not being faithful to God. When you quit on your friend that needs you, you're not being faithful to your friend. Quitting is the only way to lose. If you remain faithful, if you could just stay on that faithful track and remain faithful to God, faithful to your husband, faithful to your wife, faithful to your friends, you will win and succeed in the end. It's not the easiest path, but it will bring the victory. Let's remain faithful in our church and, and, re and realize the attacks are going to come. Don't be surprised when the trials come to try you. But be prepared for it and have, it, have your heart settled to remain faithful, to remain true, to remain loyal. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, these words of encouragement that we received, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to remain faithful in our lives, dear God. It's so important. I pray that you please help us to um, be able to make those the, the, the tough decisions in order to um, just do what's right and to not give up, dear Lord. Help us to be strengthened through your Holy Spirit. Help us to be strengthened in our lives and through your words, dear Lord, to uh, continue to do what's right. And uh, even if, if other people aren't treating us right, dear Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to follow the example that Abraham left forth for us, dear Lord. Help us to have that level of loyalty, uh, especially unto you, dear God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.